engineering economist. See the one-armed economist? Engineering economist. That's what they wanted there. Very good. So Mike Hausman, he is an economist. He was the, he's also the co-founder and chief data science officer at Rapport Boost AI, a company that uses artificial intelligence to help companies communicate more effectively with customers through chat and messaging. He's previously chief analytical officer at Evolve, where he built a machine learning platform capable of analyzing hundreds of millions of employee records. He published work in a variety of peer-reviewed journals. He re his research is profiled in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and The Atlantic. He has a master's and a PhD in applied economics, and he's quite lively despite that. Very good, right? The dismal science that we all share. And the management science from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and an AB from Harvard University. And on that, I'll turn you over into the capable hands of Mike. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, today, what I'm going to be talking about is how exponential growth in various technologies has transformed artificial intelligence and why we're having this explosion of AI talk, if you guys are following the news. Um, so we'll start by just a little bit of shock and awe. I want to share some really cool examples. We have a few interactive exercises, but then we'll take a step back and we'll ask the question, well, what is AI? Why all of a sudden has it grown? Has it become a buzzword? And then I have an ulterior motive. My goal here is in part to turn all of you into data scientists. So we'll talk about a specific problem, how Google approached that problem, how they solved that problem with AI, and then I'll walk you through a similar problem uh, that me and my colleagues encountered at the company Evolve. Uh, and then finally, I wanna give you some parting thoughts on how you should be thinking about leveraging AI in your businesses. Uh, as I mentioned, I have this ulterior motive, which is I think it's very easy to get seduced by all the sexy AI things that are out there, and we're gonna see plenty of examples of that, but most importantly, if you walk away from the next hour with any tangible skill, it should be how to see a problem, how to approach that problem, and how to think about using AI in order to solve that problem. And that framing is really crucial, and that's what takes often years of training, uh, but I think we're gonna get everyone on the same page around that. So first off, let's talk about the really fun and sexy stuff, some breakthroughs in AI. Um, I'd be remiss at Singularity University, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about the singularity, who, who knows what the singularity is? What's the school named after? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that enabled by exponential technology growth. Um, any guesses, when, when do you guys think that's going to happen? 2040, 20, what's that? Gotcha. You guys have been probably, probably mentioned earlier, so the median expert estimate is 2040. So assuming we're all staying in good shape and eating healthy, we're, we're likely to see that in our lifetimes. And I think it's going to completely change everything, right? At that point, there are a lot of existential questions that we'll dig into a little bit later. Let me give you some examples of how computers are already becoming smarter than humans at actually very complicated tasks. Who here has heard of AlphaGo or just the, um, of, of the Go machine that... Google had built in order to beat humans at, go, at the game of Go, right? What people don't realize is that AlphaGo, that occurred, we, it became better than humans, it was about a year ago. AlphaGo is no longer the best Go player in the world. There's a new machine called AlphaGo Zero that was trained in a very different way. AlphaGo was trained by feeding it millions of games of Go. AlphaGo Zero was taught by having it play itself over and over again in a technique called reinforcement learning. With reinforcement learning, you don't teach it anything other than the rules, and you give it a virtual sugar cube if it wins, and you give it a little lump of coal if it loses. And you have the machine play itself billions and billions of times, and you see how quickly it improves. So this is actually a, a visual, a video representation. On the x-axis is days, not weeks or months, but days of playing this game. On the y-axis is an ELO rating, that's how good the machine is. So let's start. Let's say on day zero, it's actually really bad, right? But you can see it's learning very, very quickly the rules of the game and how to beat itself over and over again. By day three, it's better than one of the Go masters, Lee's it all. Keeps learning and learning and learning, playing billions and billions more game of games. 21 days, that's a point at which, that's three weeks, that's the point at which it beat the existing system, AlphaGo. So now AlphaGo zero is better than AlphaGo. And then 40 days later, it's better than every version of Go, um, of AlphaGo on Earth, as well as better than every human in the world. 
right? And what's amazing to me, not only that it learned to be the best in 40 days, whereas this game is a, often takes a lifetime to master, is that when experts reviewed it playing itself, by the end of this time period, they described it as fencing on a tight wire. That they had no idea why it was doing the things that it was doing. They were learning about the game of Go from the machine because it was so seemingly erratic, but actually quite elegant. So I wanna try an interactive representation. Let's play a game. We're actually gonna train a neural net right here and now. So let me, hold on. Oops. Okay. So let's see here. Let's point at this table right here. I'm gonna train this system right now. So um, ma'am in the white jacket, I'm training the system. Could you just wave at the computer screen right here? We need you to do it for a couple minutes. Okay, that's good. Um, sir, in the vest. Okay, um, so you can stop. Um, sir, do you mind waving at the screen? Let's go. Just wave however you want. Make it a, bring it up high just so it can see you. There we go. Perfect. Okay, great. Good. And then finally, um, sir, do you mind waving at the screen? Let's try it now. There we go, make sure I can see you. Okay, cool. So now what it's done is based on who's waving, it's trying to guess what's going on. It basically labeled those images, it associates those with images, it could be sounds, um, birds chirping, guitars, so on and so forth. So let's try, why don't you try waving again? Let's see if it recognizes it. Yep, sees you waving, knows that this is, that was you. When you stop, give it a shot. All right. Weaker signal, it's picking it up, and then finally third. Oh, it's kind of seeing you're in between those two, so I think it's a little confused. Um, that's a neural net. We just built one in the span of two minutes. This is something that Google had developed. Um, this is something that was unheard of three years ago. There was something that would have taken hundreds of thousands of dollars, lots of R&D to be able to do this. Uh, now we can do it instantaneously. Uh, Stanford algorithm, let me go back to slideshow mode. Stanford algorithm was recently trained to be better at diagnosing pneumonia than Stanford doctors. This took about a month to train. Um, the inventor of this application basically said, radiologists, we should stop training radiologists right now. Uh, it's a little bit extreme, but at the end of the day, radiologists are not gonna be looking at images for much longer. Three to five years from now, they'll be prescribing more complex modalities for tra tra uh, treating patients. They're not gonna be looking at images. Computers are gonna be better at looking at images than human beings are. Let's do another one. Uh, who here has used Google Translate? Okay, I assumed a fair amount of the group. Um, did any of you notice a imp massive improvement in the algorithm, say it was about a year ago, I think? Right, do you know what, what caused that? It was fascinating. What Google did originally, well, early translation algorithms we're just translating word for word. They used a bag of word approach, right? So they said, okay, let's look for the Spanish equivalent of cat, and we're just gonna substitute that in. But the problem with that is words don't exist on their own, right? If you're translating a word like minister of agriculture, what you'll get is something like prince of farming, right? It's not the same thing. The algorithm doesn't realize that. So very quickly they said, you know what? Phrases, we need to train the algorithms using phrases. And eventually Google realized phrases aren't enough. We're actually gonna use entire sentences and paragraphs. We're gonna look at the context and semantics of each word with relation to other words in those sentences. When it started doing that, that's what got it up from that phrase-based approach to what's called this neural approach. That's Google's neural machine translation system that's approaching human levels of accuracy. So in the interest of doing one more demonstration, let's see, hold on. You guys are probably familiar with this book. It's called Don Quixote. We're going to copy and paste this. All right. Hope you guys get the sound. Lugar de la Mancha, de cuyo nombre no quiero acordarme. No tengo mucho tiempo Oops, que not, vivir. Sorry, I translated from Spanish to Spanish. It's very good. In path. a place in La Mancha, whose name I do not want to remember, there has not been a long time that lived a Hidalgo of the Spear and Shipyard, Old Buckler, Skinny Horse, and Galgo Corridor. 
a pot of something more cow than sheep, salpic on the more nights, duels and losses on Saturdays, lantias on Fridays, some palomino of addition on Sundays, consumed the three parts of his farm. The rest of it was completed by the sackcloth of sail, hairy breeches for the holidays, with his slippers of the same, and the days of the week were honored with his velory of the finest. Not bad. Still, still needs a little bit of tweaking, um, and you guys probably appreciate the nuances better than I do. Um, but this is really good. This is approaching human levels of translation. That, by the way, I should have pointed out, is an English translation that's all that's been well established as being the translation. So all of this to say that um, there are some amazing things going on in artificial intelligence that in many ways the computers are either matching human intelligence or in the case of those radiology images as well as the game of Go, it's, it's exceeding ours. Right? This is going to continue across a number of different facets. So let's take a step back. Let's first figure out, well, what is this thing that we're talking about, artificial intelligence? And more importantly, I think it's very interesting why is it that it's become a buzzword in really the last five years? In fact, what you're looking at right now is Google keywords and us plotting over time the prevalence of those keywords. You guys have probably heard about that, the Gartner hype cycle and how we hit this, hit this trough of disillusionment. This is what would happen. About 10 to 13 years ago, artificial intelligence got really hot. People said, holy God, this thing called smarter child is going to converse with me like a human being. This is amazing. Humans are obsolete. And then over time, we learned, you know what, the technology wasn't there, right? The computers weren't fast enough, the algorithm's not mature enough, and there was, you can see, this very noticeable dip in how much people were talking about AI. I've also plotted uh, machine learning, data science, and then at the bottom, oh, sorry, the blue line here is my field, econometrics, which unfortunately be, appears to be dying a slow, painful death. Uh, but AI, machine learning, data science, have picked up all of a sudden, right? Seemingly out of nowhere in the last three to five years, Everyone's talking about AI. And what I like to point out to people is that these algorithms have existed for decades. People were doing research on neural nets in the 70s. So why do you think in the last five years alone, everyone's gone AI crazy? What's changed? This is where you guys jump in. What do you think's changed in the last five years that's enabled all these advances in AI? The computing speed? Absolutely. So hardware is definitely one of them, right? There are machines now capable of running those algorithms that we knew about. What's that? Mm -hmm. I think maybe you're saying, uh, so like, oh, go ahead. Like, uh, what I mean is that maybe with more examples that we are enjoying of, uh, mm -hmm. we trust. <laughs> That's a great example and probably one I should add to the deck. Uh, training data and labeled training data is actually very rare and scarce. To train a computer to pick up on pneumonia, you need lots of labeled data. Uh, what else has changed? What's grown in the last five years that's enabled all of this AI research? What's that? Chatbots. Yeah. yeah, although those are more of an application of AI. But So here, for me, as I surveyed the literature, I realized really it's three things. Well, data is more prevalent, no question. Labeled data is actually a big constraint. Very simple. Hardware, software, people. These curves should look very familiar to you guys. Faster GPUs, open source frameworks, data scientists. So I'll jump ahead. First, GPUs. These are machines, graphical process units. These were developed to do gaming. NVIDIA was the king of GPUs. And then they realized about five, 10 years ago, holy God, these machines that we were building largely for gaming applications are really good at running neural nets. This is probably the single biggest development that's contributed to all the deep learning that you're seeing. These machines are incredibly fast and powerful, and I can rent them for pennies an hour. Open source frameworks. People don't think about this as much, but software to do these neural nets has grown exponentially in terms of, on this graph before, who's committing to them? These are open um, GitHub commits to open source deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow and Keras. Everyone's contributing to them. We're seeing exponential growth in how good they get. This is, an, is a neural net. So let me be clear, this is seven lines of code. This used to be tens of thousands of lines of code to build a neural net. Now I can do it in seven lines of code. And you saw the outcome of that when I uh, displayed it earlier. And then finally, this goes under the radar. I actually think the rate limiting step in terms of the growth of artificial intelligence is people. It's data scientists that are trained to approach problems, use the software in conjunction with the hardware to develop neural nets. 
lots of master's and PhD programs, online courses, data science boot camps, that's all feeding this funnel of data scientists. But I think the challenge in terms of diffusion, if you're not Google or Facebook, is finding people that can leverage these tools. Side note, what helped certainly was Harvard Business Review in uh, 2012 said data scientists is the sexy job of the 21st century. If they had seen me and my colleagues working on these algorithms a decade ago, I don't think sexy is the word that would come to mind. I think of it more as like revenge of the nerds. Um, but it's a, it's a very exciting time to be a data scientist. So let's define our terms. I wanna make sure we understand what we're talking about. Data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence. These things are thrown around, but they mean very different things. So who has a guess as to what the relationship is between them? Yep. The, the AI uses uh, data science to, to, to improve or to get better. And so, this is, so, so they are interconnected mm -hmm. because uh, some of them make use of the evolution of the others. Mm -hmm. so, oh. Yep, that's a good point. So there's, there is kind of an umbrella system in terms of hierarchy, right? And really at the top of it, data science is, is the top layer. Everything kind of falls under the category of data science. But data science is very broad. It includes data engineering, mining, visualization. Machine learning is really what's driving a lot of this development in AI. And specifically, there are, there are several branches of machine learning. It's this third one, deep learning, and that's looking at typically unstructured data and, on, and generating patterns of relationships between them. That's been where most of the growth has occurred recently. But machine learning broadly is something, is what facilitates a lot of the artificial intelligence that's out there. Side note, very quickly, you're gonna hear about deep learning these are models not unlike what you probably learned in college or grad school. They're relating an input to an output, but the difference is that if this is the output and this is the input, we allow there to be multiple relationships between all of the inputs, right? This is a neural net taken in no small part from neurons in a brain, right? We've studied the brain, we understand those neurons don't relate in and of themselves, they relate to one another, it's about the group. And that's what allows us to take an app and have it label food so that it can label, for example, a hot dog. I don't know if any of you watch Silicon Valley. I'm a big fan, but Silicon Valley, the show, developed an app that could identify a hot dog and what was not a hot dog, right? Now, the algorithm isn't perfect, and this is important to realize. It's just looking at representations of the pixels in relation to one another, right? So you can trick the algorithm by feeding it pixels that it lo thinks look familiar but aren't actually a representation of, of what they are. Does that make sense? At the end of the day, what it's seeing is not a hot dog, it's seeing thousands of pixels, and those pixels take on numeric values, and when it sees enough images, it says, oh, this relationship, these pixels firing in the same pattern, this looks like a hot dog. We'll come back to this in a second. But with different interaction between different inputs, or so, so, so yeah, how how you defer regular programming, which is complex, to artificial intelligence? That that's a great question, and that's actually what what I'm what I talk about in this slide, which is AI is not the same as machine learning. AI, well, machine learning is a probabilistic way of relating an input to an output, right? Artificial intelligence is separate from that. Artificial intelligence, the definition is taking tasks that humans can do relatively easily and teaching machines to do them. Now, in many cases, the two basically belong in the same bucket, right? A lot of AI is facilitated by machine learning because it's taking large data sets, synthesizing them into hot dog classification, right? But there is AI that's purely alg algorithmic and not probabilistic. You can build artificial intelligence that just says every time something you know, X happens, do Y, but where we start building models that are probabilistic, that's, that's where the machine learning piece comes in, right? So as an example here, recognizing a hot dog, if we always knew that the hot dog had this ketchup here, we could program that in, but because there are different types of hot dogs and they look in different ways, we label them, sorry, we feed the machine labeled training data and we say, okay, we're gonna give you a lot of data and we're gonna get you better and better at guessing when you're seeing a hot dog or not. So I don't know if that answers the question, but at the end of the day, it's all about building a model and assessing probabilities 
versus building an algorithm that says, okay, if, if one thing do this, if the other do that. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. For your inputs, for your model. Yep. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, exactly. Think of if you're building AI by feeding it lots and lots of data and building models, that is, that's machine learning enabled AI, right? But there's machine learning that's just pure research that doesn't build applications, and there's AI that doesn't involve machine learning at all. Uh, yeah, so for example, not from the recruiting space, um, you can, it doesn't sound like artificial intelligence, but if you tell an algorithm, okay, every time I see a resume longer than two pages, let's chop it into one page, let's send me an email. That, I know it doesn't sound like AI, but you can build sophisticated tasks like that, like a workflow for recruiting. That isn't machine learning, that's not probabilistic models, that's just saying, oh, I can teach it to do something that, like sorting resumes by, by names, that's something technically artificial intelligence. Humans can sort too, we've just taught the algorithms to do it and they can do it with absolute certainty. Um, oh, there, there, there absolutely can be, and it's no problem. There, there are normal programming skills, much of that can be considered artificial intelligence, right? So it's absolutely possible and in fact, a lot of, it's not sexy to label it that way, but yeah, very algorithmic deterministic processes can be considered AI. You, yep. descri you describe like uh, normal programming, the functions, the algorithm, this something. Um, machine learning is like compare with a lot of data and the other is a function in computer language, more or less. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a good distinction. Uh, okay, so then, side note, some of us may have heard about the debate between Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk, right? If you listen to Elon Musk, you would think that the robots are about to take over and we need to stop them immediately. Zuckerberg, on the other hand, says this is a little bit blown out of proportion uh, and that this isn't, we shouldn't be alarmist, that it's irresponsible to be um, so alarmist about this, right? But various articles are, are out there suggesting that we do need to be careful about what's going on and our sort of march towards the singularity. So I always like, I think it's an interesting debate um, for those in the crowd, how many would count yourselves in the Elon Musk camp who thinks we should be a little bit nervous and, and, and maybe regulate this? Okay, raise your hand. Okay, and then who would consider themselves to be in the Mark Zuckerberg camp? A lot of people not voting. Fewer, I typically see two-thirds Elon Musk, one-third Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and people wonder, well, what's the concern? And the reason that this is such a debate is that as data science has progressed, we've shifted in a very serious way from transparent models. So I was trained as an econometrician. Statistics and econometrics, the hallmarks of those models are that they're, rather, they're generally transparent, right? I can recreate the results using matrix math. I understand how we arrived at the results. If you give me a pen and paper, I can recreate them, although it'll take me a long time. As we've shifted to black boxes, in machine learning, there are models called boosted trees, random forests. And then when we get to deep learning, we're talking about neural nets. These are models that no human being on Earth can replicate. Right? The machine, we only know they're right because we know the machine tends to label these outcomes more effectively, more successfully than we can. But as we shift more and more, and this is how we've been marching for the last couple of decades, as we shift more and more towards these black box models, the question is, do we really understand the intuition of what's going on underneath the hood? The answer is, is we don't, and I think that's where this concern comes from, right? If we don't understand the intuition behind the models, do we understand how the machine is making the decisions that it's making, and can we control those decisions? Uh, for my own part, I will say, I do think we'll, we'll see the singularity in our lifetimes. I think we're going to see machines become smarter than human beings, the question then becomes, once they're interconnected and they're smarter than us, what do they do? How do they view human beings? Um, do they see us as some sort of existential threat? Um, because there's no question you'll be able to converse. We're only about 10 years away from you conversing with a human be uh, machine and not knowing it's a machine and thinking it's a human being. And we can teach them to have personality and to build rapport. That's 
in fact, what we're doing in my current company. Cool. Okay, so there's a lot of very futuristic stuff that we've covered, but I want to all of you to walk away with a toolkit. I want you to be able to understand how to approach a problem and how to use AI and machine learning in order to solve it. So let, let's first consult uh, my, my old friend Google. I want to understand how have they solved problems and a very specific one that may be relatable to all of you. First off, I've, I've given these talks very frequently. I've talked to a lot of execs. Here's how I think a lot of individuals view AI. I think what they think is you have problems, you have audit compliance, challenges identifying where the risk is distributed across the organization, you have high operating costs, sluggish customer growth. And I think what a lot of people think, and they approach me and I do a little bit of consulting on the side, they basically say, oh, okay, what we're gonna do is we have our data silos, we're gonna plug in something like Watson, and then all of our problems are gonna disappear. Uh, unfortunately, that's not how it works. At the end of the day, AI can be, do, can be used to really facilitate two things and two things alone, okay? Those two things are it can automate repetitive tasks. So if you feed it labeled training data from humans, we can teach an algorithm within reason to replicate the decision of humans. That's how we get really good at, um, for example, diagnosing pneumonia, because human beings have ultimately labeled those data. And the other thing we can do is augment human intelligence. So what that means is there's a whole field of behavioral economics which founds that we as human beings are actually very bad decision makers. We suffer from countless biases, uh, overconfidence bias, hot hand fallacy, um, all these biases that affect our decision making, not to mention the fact that we tend to get distracted very easily. When we're driving, we tend to be checking our phones. We don't have this unlimited concentration. And so the other application of artificial intelligence is really around enhancing human decision making and helping us make better decisions. And if we do that effectively, we're gonna help human beings make better decisions about how to invest for retirement, how to engage in healthier behaviors. There are countless problems that can be resolved simply by giving people the right information at the right time to enable them to make the right decision. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I didn't know if you were raising your hand. Go ahead. Because one of the, on the, on the previous page, how to, I mean, if, if we all have access uh, on, the, on the pension, for example, if we all have access to uh, an algorithm that allows us to make a better decision on a pension investment, we will all invest in the same pension investment so the decision change. Mm. So that's a great question. I would say that, first off, everyone's risk preferences and profiles differ. Right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that we all behave the same exact way. What it means is that the algorithms recognize those preferences and adapt rather than allowing us to make things that are acting, out, decisions that act out of our own best, uh, or that are not in line with our own best interest. Um, but there is a lot of, I had spoken to someone a couple weeks ago who thought there's a lot of speculation in the stock market. There's a lot of rise and fall in stocks that quite frankly can be attributed to human you know, irrationality right, and speculation. Um, and they do think that with algorithms helping out in a pretty minor and eventually major way, we likely won't see sort of swings that you see in something like a Bitcoin, right? Because ultimately, these decisions will be made a lot more rationally. So I think it's a fair assessment. I don't think we all do the same thing, but I do think that it slowly eliminates a lot of bad decisions. So let's talk about a very specific problem and how Google tackled it. Google operates data centers all over the world. Um, if you've ever used your laptop and done something very computationally intensive, what happens to that laptop? Jump in. The, the fan turns on, right? You're running code, all of a sudden you can hear the fan turns on. Well, imagine multiplying that by several million times, right? When they're operating these data centers, all this well, computational power requires, it generates heat, and that heat can't easily diffuse in the, within those buildings, and so they have fans and all sorts of different tools that they use to keep the temperature regulated, right? And those fans operating in tandem with one another, they generally consume about the equivalent of 400,000 households of energy, right? So we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars that are expended purely on running those fans and cooling systems. A big problem for Google. 
they had just acquired a company called DeepMind in 2015, and they said, you know what? This is a problem that's probably ripe for deep learning. The problem is, this is very challenging. The equipment, the environment, they all interact with each other in very nonlinear and complex ways. That's why they couldn't solve this using rules of thumb and heuristics. The system wasn't adapting quickly to external changes in temperature, right? So if it got really hot outside, the system was very slow to respond. It was wasting a lot of energy. And likewise, every data center has a unique architecture, environment, right? It wasn't a one-size-fits-all approach. So what they did, they decided is that instead of having human beings fine-tune and create literally millions of rules to regulate the internal environment of their systems, they decided to let a machine, and basically to let the control go to the machine. And so machine learning, I mentioned before, it's relating an input to an output in a probabilistic way. The output here is something called power usage effectiveness. What that's defined at is the proportion of electricity spent on cooling the centers and the denominator is all electricity that they use in total. Inputs, the feature set that they used where they trained models based on temperatures, based on power usage, pump speeds, set points. These were all things that they had developed models to take in and then spit out a decision. They've now fed this millions of data points that were being collected every second. They fed it to a massive neural net. They fed it to the neural net and they trained the neural net and they said, we want to reduce PUE. We want PUE to be as low as possible. And initially the, the neural net came up with a very simple explanation. It said, well, if you want to minimize this, there's one thing you should do, which is shut all the fans down. Uh, unfortunately, not an option for them. Uh, so they realized they had to retrain the models relative to future temperature and future pressure. So they said, as long as you keep temperature within certain ranges and pressure within certain ranges, you can do whatever you want in order to operate the fans and the cooling systems at different rates. This was the result. Once they did this, they found, here's, here's the PUE graph over time. They have them ML control off. They turn it on. You see a massive uh, drop in the PUE rates, how much of the electricity they were spending on cooling and fans. Just for fun, they decided to turn it off again, spike in the PUE. Right? This saves them hundreds of millions of dollars every year. And hopefully the example is a little bit relatable to different problems that you guys are encountering in your own companies. Right? You're dealing with nonlinear relationships and things that are hard for human beings to understand. Right? Different environments, factories that have different environments and ultimately need to be customized. So let's together, let's walk through this thought process of how do we solve a problem using AI? Okay, and the problem that me and my colleagues attempted to solve about 10 years ago is recruiting. So show of hands, who here has, re has recruited for a position before? I would guess everybody. Um, name some of the problems with recruiting. What were the pain points that you experienced with that? Jump in. Yep, go for it. You get too many uh, CVs, and then you need somebody to read them and choose which one is uh, good enough to keep going, for mm -hmm. example. Great example. So filtering, right? Too many resumes. You have to read through all of them. What are the other pain points around recruiting? What are the pain in the butt things that you were thinking, this gotta be, there's got to be a better way? They all look the same, so it's hard to differentiate who's going to be better down the line, five to ten months down the line. Absolutely. Any others? What's that? People. Yeah, that's another Checking. one. Re reference checks. Yeah. What's that? Fake data. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's one. So validating and checking. That's another. That is another pain point. We didn't tackle that one, but what we decided to tackle was the two problems that were mentioned initially. Right? Too many resumes. They all look very similar. It's hard to differentiate, and there's no feedback loop. When I make a hire, sometimes I see how that person does, and I correlate it with what I thought during the resume process. More often than not, I just think, oh, you know, I picked the right person, or this was a problem that didn't work out. We're going to solve that problem. First step in doing any sort of machine learning, we take data. We have to identify data that can be used to solve the problem. So let's say we want to make a process that filters resumes and makes better hiring decisions. We need to identify first the, the target, which is the outcome variable 
that we're trying to optimize and improve. What's the, think, what would the target be in this situation? If I want better hires, what's the data source that I'm gonna tap in order to find out who, who turned out better? Jump on in. How, how, how do you guys measure performance within your companies? Give me a few examples. What's that? Yep, sales. Mm -hmm. KPI data, a lot of it's set housed in HR systems, absolutely. Okay, then what are the things, so that's the outcome that we're trying to optimize. What are the inputs? What are the things that we know about the applicant during this application process? What, what pieces of information do we get? Yep, so resume data, what else? We supplement that, we don't just choose on resumes, right? What else do we use? Great, interview data, absolutely. So we have unstructured data, interview data, could be video, could be audio, anything else? References as well. All this is great. You're exactly right. So now we have target. We have features in our model. We just need to connect those, and we do it using some sort of crosswalk or connector. What people don't realize is, is the hardest part of this process is often finding that connector. Connecting dis disparate data sets is incredibly difficult, and right now it's probably the lion's share of the work. But this is exactly what we did at Evolve. We take their core HR system, we get outcomes here. We have psychometric assessments that couple resume data with things we ask them about during that application process. What are your knowledge, skills, and abilities? What sort of personality do you have that's all being fed into a large data warehouse where we apply workforce science and predictive analytics, generate a score that was green, yellow, or red that would tell us how the applicant performed. But we don't wanna get ahead of ourselves. Data integration was a massive part of this process. Pulling from these different systems was probably the hardest part of this. So I just wanna warn all of you that the model building is actually the fun stuff and probably the easiest. It's the data integration is really hard. All right, number two, we have our data. We wanna build a model. Whether you, what sort of model you build is going to depend on what is the outcome that you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to filter something and predict outcomes, we use machine learning and neural nets. If we're trying to change behavior and see a causal relationship in the data, we use econometric models, and if we can simulate things and we can make a lot of mistakes along the way because we're simulating it, we can use something like reinforcement learning. What do you guys think we were trying to do in this circumstance? Which set of models seems most appropriate? Were we trying to change behavior? Were we filtering? What was, what was it we were trying to do? Who's, who's that? Filtering. Um, building machine learning models is what we did because ultimately we have a big stack, a big pile of something, and all we want to do is say, should we hire or should we not hire the person? The way you evaluate a model is by saying, what does the model predict their performance will be, low or high? What was their actual performance? Was it low or high? You want to maximize the number of true positives and true negatives, minimize the number of false positives and false negatives. Which do you think we were more concerned with with these models? What's more costly? False positive, why is that? Absolutely. If you miss someone who's good, that's unfortunate. If you hire someone and they turn out to be really bad, not good, right? Can you think of an example where a false negative is the bigger concern? You don't, mm -hmm. con, you don't hire a, a good talent and go to the competencies a cost of opportunity. Yep. A good example is um, if we're looking for terrorists or fraud, right? False, false positive, that's not a big deal. Then we thought someone was doing bad stuff. They weren't mildly annoying. False negative is a big deal in that situation, right? So when we're gauging sensitivity of the models, we want to think about, well, what's more costly, a false positive or a false negative? That's more business requirements. That's what all of you guys understand in your businesses. To give away the punchline, um, the system worked. People who hired our green applicants relative to the baseline or the yellow, they stayed longer on the job, they performed better. This is net promoter scores. 
They performed better throughout that employee life cycle. Now, here's the interesting stuff. This is the fun stuff. Okay, we've built a model. It works. People are hiring using this system. They're getting better hires. We are not done yet. We need to identify sources of bias in these models. How do you think these models might be biased? All sorts of biases over confidence, I told you. Survivor bias, selection bias. Let's think about that. I'll give you a very specific example of how they might be biased. In my time there, my job was basically identify indicators of someone's success on the job as a function of things that we found out about them in the application process. Early on, we had a theory, you're better off looking at someone's laptop than their resume in order to identify the best hires. We looked at all these different variables and there was one thing that we found was really outstanding, right? Our job finds things that are predictive, can't easily be gamed, really quick to go through. We don't want people to drop out of the application. We found if we looked at your browser, when you logged in the application, we got a snapshot of your browser. When we looked at your browser, we actually found that they were predictive of outcomes. Amongst those in the audience, raise your hand if you use Firefox, okay? Who uses Internet Explorer? Okay, we've got a few. Chrome, majority, I'm a Chrome user as well. Inter and then um, Safari. Okay, congrats to those who use Chrome and Firefox. You stay on the job 15% longer, perform about 19% better. Now, what we realized was not that it was those browsers that enabled them to be better employees, but those are non-default browsers, right? Those come, those aren't installed with your computer by default. You have to take the initiative to install them. So for me, this is a home run because this is an incredibly powerful signal that gives us a window into an employee's performance. And we ultimately discussed and decided not to use this in our assessment. That's why I'm sharing it with all of you today. So the question is, why if this was a powerful signal that solved all of those checkboxes, why did we not use it in the algorithm? Tricky question, why did we pass? Yeah, it's, you could argue, well, it, it was, and that's it, but, so one argument, it's, it's kind of creepy, right? If I find out that people likely wouldn't have found out, but if I know you're looking at my browser, that, that is a little creepy, but more importantly, when we dug into the data, we found that there was actually an ageist effect. El older individuals tended to use Safari and Internet Explorer. If we started using that in order to discriminate based on, you know, who would get hired, we'd be discriminating against elder, uh, older individuals. As applied, there's companies that are using video technology. Remember that I showed you that image right there. It was very easy to identify which person was waving. All it sees are pixels. It doesn't know what those pixels represent, right? So what concerns would you have about using video technology to evaluate job applicants? What's that? Yeah. Imagine, it's not hard to imagine there may be workplaces out there in which white men tend to be promoted they get labeled greens, right? Women might get yellows because they tend not to move up or, or be ushered out. Minorities might be shown the door, right? If you train an algorithm based on that, it doesn't know what it's seeing. All it sees is this pattern of pixels yields someone who succeeds in this role, right? So this is really important, and this is some of the ethical concerns about how to be employing al algorithms and making sure that you de-bias them. So I only have a few minutes left, um, I'll back up. Let's talk about how you guys should be thinking about leveraging AI. There's an evolution for artificial intelligence, starts with a manual process within your organization, some pain point. A lot of people try to skip to the end. They go, okay, we're gonna fully automate this. And I've seen multiple disasters happen when we move too quickly, right? We wanna be thinking about moonshots, but we need to be making steady progress towards those. So that means in five years, enabling, using technology to enable that process. In 10 years, human in the loop, where human beings supervise what's going on. And then finally, fully automated in something like a 15 to 20 year horizon. All of you here are thinking about moonshots. I know that's the theme you guys are talking about, moonshots, and it's very exciting. But the challenge that all of you have as leaders of your organizations is balancing how do we visualize these moonshots and how do we deploy something now? NASA recently announced that in 2030, they're sending a Mar uh, rocket to Mars, right? That doesn't mean they're gonna keep shooting rockets at Mars until they hit, right? What that means is that they're going to be going through over a decade of tests, like the one on the right, which was a recent one. They're gonna be firing rockets on the ground and collecting data. 
and they're going to be building up their track record and getting lots of small wins. When you build up those small wins, that's how you get to Mars. And so that, to me, is the number one thing that I offer up when I talk to companies and I try to offer assistance with their data science efforts. You need to start small and build off of those wins. Um, and then finally, I would say, in terms of what's on the horizon, this is my own conjecture as to where I think all the advances are going to occur. Right now, image and audio classification has become very, very easy. If your company deals with images and audio, that stuff is pretty turnkey right now. You can deploy off-the-shelf solutions, and you get some pretty amazing stuff. I think in five years, we're going to see a lot of natural language recognition and also generation. Everyone got excited about bots. I work for a company and we build conversational commerce applications. We only work with human beings because we knew what was going to happen with bots. About two years ago, Facebook said, we're opening up M2 bots. We're going to de encourage developers to build bots. They did, 70% of bots failed out of the gate. And uh, Facebook actually shut down their own bot service because it couldn't get above 30% automated in terms of the human tasks that bots were able to ca were capable of developing. Doesn't mean bots aren't going to be big, it just means we're not there yet, we have a lot of development. This is that trough that we had talked about earlier. And finally, in 10 years, this is a, this is a fairly ambitious goal, but I think we're gonna see some larger problem-solving skills begin to develop. And by that, I mean we won't have to tell the computers, here's the problem, here's the pile of data, here's how you're gonna model it, here's how we're gonna generate results. We'll just tell the computer, here's the problem, point it at data, and have it come up with clever ideas for how we can solve the problem. Right. Uh, so with that, I know I'm over time and I wanna leave time for Q&A. Um, so yeah, jump, jump in. What questions do you guys have? Yes. If, uh, if we have the, the data, uh, do you think that uh, we can predict everything we want? Hmm. Well, you can large enough data pile, and also, you know, hard to do. Predicting stock returns is very challenging, right? Because you're ultimately trying to predict a lot of different human behavior, um, which can be irrational at times. But I do think things that are very tangible when we're predicting whether an image is a cat or a dog, um, whether an audio, when a, whether a person on an audio file said one thing or another, I do think if you give us a large enough pile of data there's no question we can train machines to be, we said, better than humans at identifying cancer, pneumonia, all sorts of different conditions. Um, so I'm, I'm big on this stuff, but you have to consider when you're predicting things temporarily, it's harder to predict something in the future than it is to build a model that predicts something from a pile of data representing today. Imagine that uh, that you have a technician about intelligent artificial in, in your company. What's, uh, what are the characteristics you demand to this profile of guy in order to have uh, the maximum performance? Gotcha. So you mean, you mean hiring, hiring data people. scientists? Sure, right. absolutely. That's a great question. I would say, I tell people this, the, the number one skill that I look for with data scientists that I hire is um, two things. Number one is the most important for me is attention to detail, that data science can be very tedious. You have to be very, very careful. The details matter and, and small mistakes can resonate. But I'd say beyond that, what matters most is creativity and, and framing a problem. That's kind of why we spent some time approaching a problem here. Because at the end of the day, a lot of my job is being automated. The model building, once I have the data in one place, I can feed it to platforms that will generate a solution very, very easily. And we're quickly automating the gathering up of the data. What I think is the longest tail in terms of automation is how to frame the problem, right? How to think about it the way we did here, which is my problem is recruiting. There are specific things about recruiting that matter. How do we? identify outcomes, how do we identify the inputs to those models, that's something that algorithms can't do right now. And so if you're looking for good data scientists, you know, you want, the, you know, you want some experience having done this, you want that attention to detail, but the hardest thing to train is how to frame a problem and how to identify data sources that can answer that problem. No. 
you said that your your company your, the work you work with uh, is developing a personality for uh, AI. Mm -hmm. What sort of uh, clients or what sort of uh, companies, other companies, uh, require this sort of service? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what we work with is companies that are using chat and messaging to engage with customers. Typically, if you go on a website, there's a little chat box that appears in the bottom right-hand corner. In those cases, the conversation is the experience. And so I got very interested many years ago in natural language and trying to decipher what makes for a good conversation and how can you tell two people are building synergy. And so what we've done is reverse engineered that. And we did that not by using human labeled data, but we take conversational data, we connect it to outcomes, customer satisfaction, often sales conversion data, order size. And then we say, what about this conversation led to there being an order or not? Right? And that means taking a bunch of words in a conversation that happen in any sort of sequence that can often be in relation to one another and boiling it down to what was the number of emoticons you used and how many questions did you ask and did you talk about the weather and small talk? Did you greet the person by their first name or did you um, laugh with their jokes, right? And ultimately, we're getting a very robust set of intelligence around what makes for a good conversation and we're feeding that to human beings and coaching them. Because again, I'm a big believer in that human in the loop approach. So we're not gonna try to automate their jobs, we're gonna coach them and we're gonna see when we coach them, do they get better? And the answer is they do. And having done that, the longer term goal, our moonshot, five years down the line, is feeding that same intelligence to bots. Right? And we have a thesis, which is bots are learning how to automate conversations slowly and they're learning how to respond, but they don't build rapport well at all. They have no EQ. And so our goal is to basically be the EQ engine for bots and to make it so that not only can you not tell from their grammar and syntax whether they're human, but you also can't tell because they're making jokes, right? And they're, and they're developed, they know how to speak to you in a way that, that really resonates. So, thanks for asking, I like talking about this stuff. Um, yep, yeah, I think we've got a microphone over there, go ahead. What's your view about these uh, cognitive computing systems like IBM, Watson, and G, Predix? Where do you put yep. this, this kind of uh, new approaches for diagnosis of different diseases, helping doctors to treat cancer? Mm -hmm. What's your view on this? Yeah, it's, so I've got a kind of interesting view. I would say this. First off, I think, does anyone here work for IBM? Or did they? I'd, I'd share it regardless, which I think IBM, the, the greatest two things that they have done is winning at Jeopardy and then marketing Watson, right? I actually think they're in some ways a technology in, in search of a problem. Um, winning at Jeopardy is great, but that doesn't really solve any core problems. And they've been struggling for years to find what is it we can point this really impressive algorithm at in order to solve a problem. And the one thing that I think they've actually done pretty well is with medical, especially unstructured medical data, they seem to be onto something there. Um, and there seem to be, I know I've heard stories of Watson diagnosing patients that were undiagnosable. So I think if I was them, I would double down on that because I've seen them apply it to HR decision making, right? That's my world. And they advertise the ability of Watson to analyze piles and piles of resumes in an unstructured way and then spit out results. And no one I've talked to has said it works even remotely. Um, so I think it's one of those, like, very powerful, really good at understanding mass quantities of data, and for example, Wikipedia or a me medical record, um, not nearly as good at a lot of other problems. And that's why the, they have all these initiatives, because they're, li they're literally saying, well, what can we point this thing at? Um, not to, again, and, and um, we had alluded to it before, there's general and specific artificial intelligence, and we'll eventually get to general, but right now, the most effective use of artificial intelligence is solving very specific problems. Can I enhance my customer growth? Can I recruit better talent, right? When we solve those problems, there's a general intelligence that, that will ultimately be amassed. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I have two questions. Yeah. One of is how we'll see the AI in our cell phones? Mm -hmm. Sector that do you think will take more advantage on this technology? What was the second, we'll take Sector more what? Mm. Which that will take more advantage. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, 
So we'll start with the first, uh, probably because it's easier. I mean, the, you know, your, your cell phone already has a ton of artificial intelligence built in. You're gonna see this increasingly. Right now, it, it recognizes your fingerprint. It's gonna recognize your face very soon. Um, I think the real interesting things will be, and it, of course, when you tag photos, I looked at, uh, I wanted to look for an old wedding photo. I typed in wedding, um, and automatically I saw a lot of photos, especially photos in photo booths. I think it associates that with wedding, but um, there's a ton of AI built in those in your phones, and it's only going to increase because those chips are getting smaller, they're getting faster. The phone, I think, will be more customized and more personalized. And I think that's the big change, is it's gonna recognize, and that's what we're building at Rapport Booth, recognizing personalities and clusters of individuals and saying, okay, if I'm a millennial, this is my profile, I'm probably gonna be more interested. It's gonna push information out at you rather than just being a receiver of your preferences. Right? And in the same way, your Facebook feed is curated and it's gotten very smart at understanding what news you're gonna to wanna to see. Your phone is gonna be able to anticipate what you need before you even pick it up. Um, sectors that are gonna take advantage of this, um, it's, a tough, it's a tough question. Uh, I see it, I mean, AI is really just making its way across everywhere. I, I, I know the slow movers tend to be, I think um, anything sales facing, retail, tends to be very quick adopting, marketing, was ahead of the curve many years ago. HR was always a slow one, which is why we had to build a platform for recruiting. Um, I'm seeing, so yeah, HR, manufacturing, Andrew Ng just started a company that's focused on bringing AI to factories. Um, so I think any of those industries tend to be a little bit slower. Um, and we're seeing a lot of really fast adoption within retail customers, within anything service oriented, for what it's worth. Hope that helps. Yes. Yep. Yes. Regarding the manufacturing processes. Yep. Where do you think the the artificial intelligence could be applied? And I have another question. Imagine that you think that the artificial intelligence could be applied in the company, but you don't know exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. How would you do? Yeah. In order to identify and implement uh, this new technology. Yeah. Thank you. Those are tough questions, and I'm running short on, short on time. Um, I'll try to be quick. Um, manufacturing, it's funny you asked me this. I'm giving another talk in two days to a manufacturing company. Um, there are a few places. Number one, smart components, sensors. As you know, everything is going to be embedded with microchips, if it isn't already. Um, that's an obvious application for AI, smart everything, smart chairs, smart glasses, smart everything. And you're starting to see that now if you go to CES. More importantly, though, those devices are all gonna to talk to one another, right? They're actually gonna form a large net and they will anticipate your needs. You know, I'm talking to this company, they build components for cars. Those brakes they're building not only are gonna feed information from the car to the company so they can make better brakes, those brakes are gonna to talk to the steering wheel. Those brakes are gonna to talk to the radio and the seats, right? They're gonna actually change what they do in response to changes in the car and outside the car. Um, so that to me is, you know, where for manufacturing, if you're building something, building something smart and connecting it to other devices is gonna be really key. Um, in addition to, you have an organization, you want it to be more efficient, you want it to spend money more effectively, all of those things are slowly being improved with AI. Um, your second question, which now escapes me. Give, me, give me this one more time, remind me, what was the second question? Sorry. I think that the artificial intelligence could be applied in my company, but I don't yes. know where and, and, and how. Yes, sorry about that. Um, it's a great question, and, and this is what I would say. Build a roadmap for one of those moonshots that we're talking about. Think about the horizon, but in you need to build off of quick wins, and what that means is find first a problem in the organization that you think, or list off the problems that you think AI could be applied. Right? You run into problems all the time, right? Inaccurate, auditing is a pain, compliance is a pain, expense reporting, you can name any number of things. What are the areas that are most core to the business that create value, and what are the areas that you think could be automated relatively easily? Right? It's like a two by two matrix. Start with the projects that are highest value and potentially the easiest, and you wanna build off of those wins. So think about, and remember that framework that I mentioned earlier, are the repetitive tasks where we think AI could automate it? Or is there a lot of decision making that we think is resulting in bad decisions? So if it was me in the organization, I'd identify problems that fall into those two categories 
and then start exploring solutions. And don't be afraid to use off-the-shelf solutions. Example, I cut this short a little bit. So at Reportbus, we're doing natural language processing. We're doing things like sentiment analysis, personality analysis. We, offsor we outsource everything we can, right? We're not worried about building a IP because there's plenty of IP there. We don't want to have to spend time building a sentiment analyzer. Google's been analyzing sentiment for a decade. We're not going to do any better than Google. We can use their tools in order to help us solve our problem. So don't, don't think it needs to be invented here. Feel free to outsource. If you find a problem, deploy an off-the-shelf technology. See if it works. If it does, now you can trumpet it to the rest of the organization and say, hey, we solved this problem with AI. What's the next problem? So, yeah, if I could leave you all. Yeah, that's the, um, I'm, oh, go ahead, jump in. If we've got time for one more. Or, yeah, I'm already running short. Very quick one. Yep. Um, is there any research on how AI works um, better or not with certain cultures that may be less standardized? Because you mentioned before what is really difficult is to predict human behaviors. So if you are in a society that is very standard in, in the way they behave, it's maybe easier than in others. Is there any research on this? And maybe linked to this, um, a lot of research on AI happens here in the US, but I also read that China is kind of ahead on this. Is there any main differences in the research that is done in the two geographies? No. Right. They probably don't have time for both. Very quickly, I would say, no question there are, for, I'll give you an example again from Reportbus. We see different languages communicate in different ways, and it's really an English-focused solution, but we look at Australian English, British English, American English, very different language patterns. Different things resonate in those three countries. Um, that said, variation isn't a problem. If you give me enough data, even variation in the data, there's, there's going to be something interesting that comes out of it. It's more how random is that variation. And if you could think of, we call it signal to noise, but how strong is the signal relative to the noise? And if there's a lot of randomness, that's when it becomes harder. But that one culture tends to be a little bit more consistent, uh, isn't necessarily a problem, uh, as long as it's not completely random. So, sorry, I feel like I've gone over time, so I wanna let, hand it off, but. Yeah, yep, yeah. absolutely, thank you.